As a formality, Dr. Tucker would like, us, like to state that his views expressed today are not necessarily the views of the United States government. And now, please welcome today's speaker, David Tucker. Good afternoon. I want to thank uh, Peter Schramm for inviting me and Diana for that very kind introduction. <coughs> On previous trips to Ashland, I've found that often the most dangerous part of the visit is Peter's introduction. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm glad I escaped that this, this afternoon. I'm going to talk about fighting barbarians. Um, it's kind of an odd title. I recognize that. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, my, my seven-year-old son, Nathan, asked me what I was working on a computer on. And I told him it was fighting barbarians. And he said, wow, awesome. Um, <laughs> I found out later why he was so impressed. He thought I was inventing a new computer game. And I, I have to admit, there's something, uh, using this term barbarian makes, uh, it, it does sound perhaps a little bit ridiculous. We don't use that term much anymore. But I'd like to try to revive it. And I do so in part because there's, there are good American precedents for this term. Uh, the two I have in mind really are one from Thomas Jefferson and one from the Republican Party platform in 1856. Jefferson, in the only book he wrote, said that the American Indians were barbarians because they believed that might makes right, uh, simply because they were stronger, uh, they, they did what they wanted. And proof of this for Jefferson, which he mentioned, was the fact that they made their women do all the work. This, this <laughs> Jefferson was a very wise man, I think. No, not, not obviously that he made women do the, that, not wise in saying that women should do the work, but I think there, there's something important that he noticed there. And this, believe it or not, was actually, I believe, I can't prove this, but I believe something like this was behind what the Republicans said in 1856, because in their party platform in that year, they said they were opposed to the twin relics of barbarism, polygamy and slavery. So you note that in both these instances, what civilized has something to do with the uh, proper treatment of women or with the family more generally. So those are the precedents for reviving this, this term. But you may be wondering, what's that got to do with scouting the future and American foreign policy, which is the theme of these lunchtime talks? The connection is this. There's a, a small but I think very influential group of writers who uh, publish and discuss America's foreign policy who have argued that in the future, what will give the greatest, uh, pose the greatest problem for the United States are not uh, high-tech armies like our own, but in fact, uh, people that you could describe as barbarians. Uh, these will savage fighters who will stop at nothing to gain victory, absolutely nothing. Not only will they do anything to win, but they'll actually enjoy doing this. Torture and rape, they will consider sport, slaughtering children in the old, this kind of pleasant afternoon's work, breaking treaties, no more, no more problem than taking a breath. It's possible that such people will defeat us on battlefields, but these writers think that it's more likely that because they're so cunning and fierce, they will actually avoid fighting us uh, in, a, in a major battle the way we fought the Iraqis uh, in the Gulf War. And they'll instead uh, attack using terrorism, subversion, uh, indirect means, because they, this way they can avoid what we're best at and inflict a lot of damage on us. But, but the, the thing that's most interesting to me, and I think most critical, and really what I want to talk about uh, at, at length today, is the fact that these writers believe that the critical vulnerability will not be our facilities overseas or, or our military uh, attack through terrorism, as has happened in Saudi Arabia in the past couple of years. But the most vulnerable point will be the American people. It'll be us. And that in the future, we are likely to be attacked not by an army, but by a host of methods which uh, these writers argue will ultimately defeat us. For example, they'll attack <clears throat> the information systems that our economy depends on and our comfort depends on. They will broadcast to us live via satellite uh, much the way CNN comes to us now, uh, 
pictures of our mutilated prisoners of war, which of course in the future, if current trends continue, will include women. And that these people will even send these uh, disfigured and, and mutilated prisoners of war back to us as a kind of derisive goodwill gesture. And that these people will, will use weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological weapons in the United States uh, in single attacks, terrorist attacks. So that in the future, the United States will be defeated not on a, on a battlefield, uh, but will be defeated because the will of its people to fight on will be broken by these kind of attacks I've just described. So when we look to the future, when we scout the future, what they see is that we will be, the American people will be overwhelmed by this uh, avalanche of barbarism. It's hard to believe, and I, I find it hard to believe, although I professionally I work on, on some of these issues, I find it hard to believe that such a future awaits us, yet it may. Nothing that I've described is physically or morally impossible, therefore it could happen. And we certainly, with the experience of Bosnia uh, behind us, we realize that there are atrocities that we uh, perhaps sometimes think we are, we as a, uh, as, a, as a race, a human race, think maybe we are beyond, but in fact, they do occur. So these things could, could occur to us. And I think they're, they're more likely to occur simply because our military now is so much more powerful. Our organized conventional military forces are so much more powerful than anybody else's and are very likely to remain that much more powerful for who knows but perhaps a couple of decades to come. So for these reasons these kinds of attacks could occur. We might say well look one way to avoid these kinds of problems is to simply avoid engaging overseas and to some extent I, I have sympathy with that argument. I think there are if you look at some of our past uh, efforts Somalia for example um, and even Haiti, I think there's very little reason uh, for us to have been engaged in those places. But no matter how much we try to limit where we're involved overseas, we will have to be involved overseas. We can't completely isolate ourselves from these kinds of threats. And in fact, as long as we may remain, as I think we must, an open country with open borders, we'll be vulnerable to these kinds of attacks. We also might say, well, look, you know, you say this is a small group of influential writers, maybe they're cranks, but what strikes me about these people is that uh, they're not cranks, really. Some of them are very well known and very well respected, as they should be for the work they've done. And I'll just mention one other thing, which to me I find very disturbing. There was a, uh, reported in the press, uh, a large gathering of military officers to discuss the future of warfare. And this included some very senior, the most senior officers in the U.S. military. And in the course of this, a, a younger officer, a junior officer, gave a speech in which he said that despite the fact that the U.S. military was now and was likely to remain the best equipped, trained, and prepared force, uh, military force on the, on the earth, the United States may be defeated simply because, quote, the American people have lost the warrior's edge, end quote. We can no longer endure casualties or the suffering associated with war and conflict. So. I think we, can, we can't simply dismiss, dismiss this as the, the, the ravings of a, few, of a few cranks. And we have to accept the fact that these things may occur and that there has been a very serious, I think, very serious um, uh, criticism lodged against us, the American people. So much so that a, recently a congressman mused whether it was necessary to hire mercenaries to defend America. I think this is really a shocking, shocking thing. I hope, I hope uh, that comes as a, a surprise to everyone in this room. Uh, fortunately, it was not a congressman from Ohio. It's from New Jersey. Um, but still, I think we should all be shocked by that, the thought that a congressman believes that the American people uh, may no longer have the stuff, the courage to defend themselves. Because I think if we've lost that, we've really lost everything. I mean, that's the foundation of our whatever civic virtues we may still possess as a people. And if we have lost that, I really think there would be no hope. The single bit of evidence most frequently cited for the case that we, the American people, can no longer uh, put up with the suffering that fighting gives rise to is what happened in Somalia in 1993. I'm referring to the incident where um, American soldiers went after uh, Mohammed Idid tried to capture him, 
uh, a helicopter was shot down. Uh, the American troops refused to leave the, the wounded and in any case quickly became surrounded. And they were there uh, in a very difficult situation for, for many hours. Uh, the result, there were 18 of them killed. As a result of that, President Clinton almost immediately changed his policy in Somalia and negotiated with the Congress and announced, we're going to be out in six months. So this, this event has become, really become the touchstone uh, for the kind of argument that I was just describing. Uh, it's cited over and over again as proof that the American people can't stand casualties. And therefore, we really won't be able to carry on a foreign policy. Now, you may say, well, Somalia, as I've just said, I, that Somalia was a mistake. But that's really beside the point, because there will be other places. Uh, and in fact, uh, you can think of Saudi Arabia, where, as I've mentioned, there have been more than 18, 25 Americans killed in the past two years and hundreds wounded from two separate terrorist incidents. So we will suffer casualties like this. And this event has now is just cited as proof that the American people are incapable of, in effect, as in the extreme case that this congressman and I refer to, incapable of defending ourselves. But I want to uh, I want to argue that that this is largely a mistaken notion of what the American people believe and feel. What's interesting to me is having looked at uh, opinion polling that covers the period leading up to October 3rd, 1993, and the period immediately following, is that in fact, most Americans, uh, almost two thirds of Americans, didn't want to withdraw from Somalia immediately as a result of the death of 18 soldiers. And it's, on the contrary, there were several polls that found that a majority of Americans actually wanted to go after Mohammed Idid uh, with a lot more vigor than we had used uh, up to that point. This was a view that was not uncommon in the military. Uh, some people uh, that, I, that I work with, in fact, said this was not a defeat. It was, in fact, a victory because estimates are that up to, well, they, they vary, but, but many over a thousand Somalis, possibly, 1,200 is some estimate, were killed in this fight. And the view of some of these military officers was this is a great uh, uh, exchange ratio, so to speak. If we fight them three more times, Idid will have no troops left. Uh, and a lot of people have laughed at that and said, oh, that's just because the military thinks that way. But that was actually, according to this polling evidence, uh, kind of the view of, um, of at least according to three polls of a majority of Americans at the time. Another thing that's important to note is that, in fact, in the case of Somalia, support for, the, for engagement there had been dwindling even before October 3rd because we had changed our policy. We initially went in, as you, you may recall, President Bush ordered uh, the Marines to go in to provide humanitarian relief, to quell the fighting in Somalia long enough for food to get to the starving. And there were estimates that maybe up to two million people would starve to death unless he did this. But when the new administration came in, the, the goal of the involvement in Somalia changed gradually. And as it changed to one of trying to restore Somalia to full nationhood, support of the American people began to trail off. So that when the event occurred on October 3rd, you could really see this as a, as a continuation of a trend in loss of support for that particular campaign and not uh, a referendum on the deaths of those American soldiers. So I think that if you, if, you, if, you, if you look at this event and you look at what's been said, what, what the polls reveal, you in fact come to the conclusion that it's been misinterpreted, that it was in fact not 18 deaths that forced us from Somalia. I think this is really part of a larger pattern. That is to say, if you look back as far as the Second World War, the American public has been concerned about casualties as, as we should be. <clears throat> But we've been willing to suffer them as long as we believe that the casualties were taken in a good cause and there was a good chance that the military operation would succeed. And I think it's only because recently we have been involved in places where our, where, uh, our activities have been questionable or, or the methods we've used have been, have been questionable that support for these operations have become questionable. And this whole issue has arisen as to whether or not the American people can stand withstand casualties. As I've said, I think if you look at Bosnia, Haiti, uh, and Somalia, certainly in the case of ha Haiti and Somalia, there's a question, a good one, I think, as to whether we should have been there in the first place. And secondly, in Bosnia, the question is, is Bosnia really the place, I believe the Balkans, 
and this may be a subject that we could, we could enter, in, enter into in discussion. It's a fairly complicated one, but I think the Balkans are a place where we need to be. But is Bosnia the way to do it, and is a peacekeeping mission the way to do it? Uh, from what I can tell, the American public is generally suspicious of peacekeeping missions, I think, for good reasons, especially when they're under UN, UN, the UN mandate. So it's, again, it's not because the American people can't or become progressively disinclined to suffer or to, to uh, tolerate casualties, but in fact that over recent years, since the end of the Cold War, the end of the Gulf War, really, the kinds of military operations we've undertaken have been, in fact, questionable. And the American people, being a questioning sort and not docile, have rightly questioned them. I think also you, <coughs> my, uh, my optimism about our, about our character as a people is supported if you think about the Gulf War. Even though, if you remember, before the fighting started, there were predictions of 20,000, 30,000 American casualties. And the US military shipped over 20,000 caskets to the Middle East. Despite that, a majority of the American people believed the war should be fought. I mean, strong majorities fought, believed that. Or again, if you think, to go back to that instance I mentioned a little while ago, in Saudi Arabia, we, we, there have been 25 Americans killed, not just servicemen, but some uh, uh, Americans working on contracts at these two facilities, plus hundreds of people injured in the past couple of years, and there's been no outcry to withdraw from Saudi Arabia. In both these cases, I think it shows that the American people understand that the Middle East uh, is important to us. And therefore, as long as they have faith that the government is pursuing a policy that makes sense, they're willing to support the costs, in human terms, of maintaining our presence there and our position there. So I think for all these reasons, uh, I'm, I'm encouraged and not uh, discouraged about our character and our willing, willingness to do what we need to do in the years to come. I think in general what I've been describing, this, uh, the questioning that the American people pose to their president and secretary of state and defense about what we're doing and where we're doing it, are not signs of cowardice, but it's a, it's a rational approach that we as, a, as, a, as people who govern ourselves ought to take, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's not cowardly, it's reasonable to require that the government have a strategy and, and, and pursue that strategy in a prudent way. And it's not cowardly, it's re again, it's reasonable to want the military to be concerned about the number of casualties uh, among its troops. So again, none of those things, they all, these seem reasonable to me, they're things that, that politicians and uh, people in positions of authority should expect from the American people and not read as signs of cowardice or, or unwillingness to fight. And finally, to take, to take one, uh, one issue that I think may become more important in the years to come. If you remember at the end of the Gulf War, uh, there was this so-called episode of the Highway of Death. This is where there were pictures on television of the destruction of an Iraqi column fleeing north. And President Bush has, has publicly said that this was something that weighed very heavily in his decision to end the war. Some people have pointed to this and said, see, the American people just don't have the stomach for it. Not only do they not want their own uh, soldiers injured, but they can't even stand hurting other people. And uh, I think there's some truth to that. Uh, I don't think anybody who saw those pictures uh, wanted to rejoice and, and dance in the streets at our triumph over the Iraqis. I think there was concern about the amount of damage we were inflicting. Again, I don't see this as a, I see this as a virtue in the American people, not a vice. If you recall those two uh, precedents for the term barbarism that I began with. I think in both of them there's a sense that how the strong treat the weak is central to the notion of who is civilized and who is not. If you remember the images when uh, from October 3rd there were images of these uh, Somalis uh, dragging the corpse of an American through the streets and dancing around. Uh, that's not something that um, if I can say, it, say so civilized people would do. And I think the fact that the Americans wouldn't do that and that we actually had a concern for the Iraqis is uh, another example of a virtue and not a vice. But what, ha what about these even more extreme uh, situations that some people have discussed where we anticipate that there might be terrorist attacks in the United States using weapons of mass destruction? 
Uh, I think far from cowing us or, or making us uh, want to uh, quit whatever struggle we are involved in, such an attack would, would incline us to seek revenge, justifiably. I mean, if you, studies that have been done of the, of the bombings, of mass bombings of civilians in the Second World War, for example, show that these did not cause those populations to lose spirit and want to surrender. On the contrary, if anything, it seems to have hardened them, and I think the same thing would occur here. So in general, I conclude that, that we're in pretty good shape as far as those attitudes that are necessary for us to conduct our foreign policy in the future. And I think there's even, there's even some hope with regard to what I think is perhaps the only justifiable criticism uh, of us as a people, which is that we may not have the, the willingness to sustain a fight over the long term. But I think that if you consider what we've done against terrorism, which has been a very difficult struggle now for 25 or 30 years, it shows that we can in fact sustain uh, against a very elusive and difficult enemy, can sustain a struggle, even though there have been lots of, in lots of instances where uh, we have suffered, if you think of Pan Am 103 or the bombing of the Marine barracks in Lebanon. This has not cause caused us to want to appease terrorists, on the contrary, we maintain, among all the nations in the world, I think the, the toughest position on terrorism. So in general, I'm, I'm optimistic about these things. But I'd like to conclude by raising one last issue, which is very, uh, very much in the news now. And I, I don't, frankly, have an answer for it. And I think it's a, perhaps the most difficult problem that a, a future president may face and that we, as a, as a people, may face, or it's at least an example of such a problem. That is the issue that's been raised by Saddam Hussein's use of innocence, women and children, to guard facilities where we think his weapons of mass destruction are. I think we have to ask, if it comes to it, it hasn't yet, but if it comes to it, would we support a president who authorized attacks on such facilities, knowing that they would kill women and children? So I say I don't have an answer for that. There's a precedent for this, of course, in the Gulf War, but President Bush uh, was lucky enough to, to escape having to make that awful decision. A future president may not be so lucky. In general, I think we may face in the future situations that are so difficult that what distinguishes us from a barbarian like, like Saddam Hussein will be nothing more than our extreme reluctance to do what a barbarian would do without a qualm and, with, and even with some pleasure. Thinking about that, I was reminded of a of some words of Winston Churchill, and I'd like to conclude by quoting them. With such a, a terrible prospect in mind of what to do in a situation where these weapons are guarded by innocence, I recalled that in the last speech that Churchill gave uh, on defense in the parliament, he had in mind uh, the, the, new, the new emergence of nuclear weapons and the fear that these might be launched uh, at Britain uh, and the destruction that, that they would cause. And Churchill, in his, his final speech, I think he had words that we, we would do well to recall as we face the future, an uncertain future in which we may indeed face barbarians, people of, of capable of uh, almost unspeakable, unspeakable savagery. Churchill reminded his listeners of their fondest hopes and of the only sure way to attain them, if they can be attained. To the parliament, and I think to the world and, and to us, Churchill said, the day may dawn when fair play, love for one's fellow men, respect for justice and freedom will enable tormented generations to march forth serene and triumphant from the hideous epoch in which we will have to dwell. Meanwhile, never flinch, never weary, never despair. Thank you.